It's March 8th, and I'm your host, Paula Hersey. On Barnstable today, we head out to the Marston's Mills, out to Marston's Mills to learn how to count herring, stop in HYCC for updates on spring programs and the Youth Summit, and learn more about Shell Fishing 101, a course through the County Extension. Up next, Municipal News and Notes. Daylight Savings Time begins early Sunday morning, and state fire officials are reminding residents to check their smoke alarms as they move clocks forward an hour. Next Friday, March 15th, the annual Youth Summit for all Barnstable Public Schools 7th graders will be at the Cape Cod Community College. We check in with the Barnstable Youth Commission for the details. Hi, I'm Matthew McCauley. I'm Chairman of the Youth Commission. I'm Connor Levesque, and I'm a member of the Youth Commission. And I'm Lucas McCauley, also a member of the Youth Commission. The 7th grade Youth Summit is an event that we are hosting annually. Um, this year is our fifth at the... Um, at the Cape Cod Community College where we bring all the seventh graders in the Barnstable School District to the campus and we basically host an event about making decisions going into high school and looking into the prevention of uh, making poor decisions, going into substance abuse and problems that may arise as students enter high school. Well, the reason why we do it to seventh graders is because we would like them to be introduced to these ideas before they get into high school rather than during high school when they can already have these temptations around them and such? Uh, so I went through the program and I really felt like the speakers kind of knew how to t uh, make you learn, uh, make you teach you, really teach you. That's their, they guide you and kind of know how to prepare you to go into high school and maybe make these right decisions. So this year we have um, Kevin Stevens, um, who is a um, a former N NHL player uh, for the Penguins. Uh, we also have Kevin Rosario from Gosnold, and we have um, Kevin, Hackins Kevin Hackinson um, from Dynamic Influence, which are all great presentations. So for some, I would say that it can be a little um, surprising or it can take some off guard, but for many others, actually, they're quite understanding of the situation and even thankful sometimes. I mean, we've had situations where students will stop us and really tell us thank you for being able to start a discussion that they weren't comfortable with starting before. So it is Friday, March 15th at um, Four Seas, and it is throughout the entire um, intermediate school uh, school day. We'll see all the 7th graders on the 15th. There is still time and space to enroll your child in an after-school program. John Gleason, Assistant Director of Barnstable Recreation, has more. Uh, but we have a lot of programs to offer this spring for uh, youth uh, after school, the 4th fourth fourth through 7th graders, and then kindergarten through 3rd graders on the weekends. Uh, there's plenty of activities to uh, engage in. So uh, fourth through seventh graders, we have um, softball at night. We're really trying to re revitalize the softball program in town for girls. Um, over the years, um, it's kind of declined to, due to you know, year-round soccer, lacrosse. Um, so we're really trying to uh, bring that program back up to what it was you know, 10 to 15 years ago and get the girls engaged and involved in that sport. Um, Melanie Mimo is doing that. Uh, we have after-school flag football or spring sports, um, ty typically for the boys uh, in fourth through seventh grade. Uh, we have babysitting, we have outdoor adventure, bowling, uh, our typical type of spring programs for the after-school kids. Well, with the after-school program that we've been doing at the HYCC, we do bus the children from uh, Barnesville United and BIS for the HYCC after program. Uh, all, all the traditional programs after school, the kids walk down to the gymnasium or meet us in a hallway to walk out to the fields. Um, if they're doing, for example, if they're doing our girls lacrosse program after school, they'll meet uh, in the hallway or in the gymnasium and then walk outside to the fields from there. Um, if they're going to like an outdoor adventure class, we have a van there that uh, picks them up to the schools and then takes them out to their, you know, to a hiking trail or to the beach to uh, do some adventures uh, hiking with uh, Miss Andrea. So the typical after school program is 2.30 uh, to 4.30. Uh, but it does uh, vary slightly. Some programs will end at five, um, but the typical after school program goes 2.30 uh, to 4.30. And then there's a few that extend a little beyond that. Um, we do have uh, some extended time where parents, if they're getting out of work at 4.30, we do have a little you know, 15 to 20 minute leeway window for them to uh, come pick up their child. Um, or they can always communicate with us ahead, you know, in advance, letting us know that, 
you know, they really want their child to participate in this program, but they, you know, get out of work at 4.30 if they wouldn't mind, uh, you know, us waiting 10 to 15 minutes, which, you know, we'd be glad to do. Um, we want as many children to participate as we can, so we try to accommodate the best we can for every parent. Uh, some of the programs we have during the weekend for the younger children are soccer. Uh, we have a big program with Coach Doc from UKSD. Uh, he uh, works with the young players uh, at McBaron Field in the spring. Uh, programs last anywhere from 45 minutes to just over an hour. Uh, they work on a lot of skills. Uh, each child gets a ball, so they get a lot of uh, touches with their feet to work on the skills. Um, and not only do they work on the skills, they have a, a, a good time with that. My youngest child participates in that program, and she always has a blast uh, going there. And then when she's done, she always wants to play more. So that's a great program for the young children. Um, we also have an uh, intro lacrosse program for young girls to do that. Uh, we have a cross-country running program that spans all ages, uh, second grade through seventh grade. Um, we try to instill um, you know, running at a long distance to teach the kids to train to do like a, you know, eventually like a 5K at the end. Uh, but the younger kids, you know, to run a half mile, mile, mile and a half, you know, so it's not just a quick sprint from point A to point B. We're teaching them to slow down their pace a little bit so they can run for a longer period of time, which then, you know, creates a longer distance. Um, and we have just, uh, we have our typical Friday night social with uh, Mickey Davies, that's a special needs group that meets every Friday night. Um, and they also meet uh, Saturday Sunshines and Saturdays where Mickey takes them out to places to eat. In the spring, they'll do a lot of yard sailing. Um, they'll do a lot of great things. So we, ha we have a wide range of activities to do for the spring. So don't hesitate to call us, uh, go on our website, check out our Facebook page, um, and uh, look to see what we do. And uh, don't hesitate to call us, and we'd be glad to help out. Uh, there is no uh, cutoff unless we fill up a program, but uh, we'll take children in our program up into the start date of the class and even uh, shortly thereafter. Um, you know, uh, take a look at the brochure that we have. Uh, it's available online, and it also went through home uh, through the kids' backpack. So take a, you know, uh, a look through that. So there's plenty of things to get involved in and try to find something that your child might want to engage in. And uh, call us up if you have any questions. We'd be happy to help. Okay, yeah, so you can re register on the website, so the Town of Barnesville website, you click on to the recreation page and there's a button to uh, do online registration. Um, or you can come in in person Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4 o'clock and register your child for uh, any programs that are still available. One fish, two fish, three fish. Natural Resource Officer Amy Croto teaches us the basics of counting herring. This important... Uh, river herring are considered a keystone species, which means they, 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 they fill a very sort of specific niche. Um, they're extremely important as a food source in areas where you have fish runs that are completely open to spawning grounds, but you don't have a lot of fish showing up. It's typically an indicator of poor water quality. Um, so they help you sort of keep an eye on your water quality. They help you um, maintain the health of your streams, um, and they are a, a very important food source for local wildlife. Right. So is this a natural fish run, or was this built at some point in time so and then now maintained? The Marshall's Mills River itself is a natural herring spawning run. Yep. However, the Mills River itself, as it curves around, ended up going through a number of cranberry bogs. So this thousand-foot fishway that we call the flume was created as a diversion to keep those fish from getting into the cranberry bogs and dying. This is the counter board that people will encounter down at the water. We're not installing it quite yet because the fish aren't physically here yet. Um, but this is when you see a fish pass over this board, which will be in the water, would be when you would count that you've seen a fish and oh. continue that process throughout the counts. Okay, excellent. So this board goes inside down here. Okay. So it'll be resting in the water. There's way too much water there right now for me to even entertain the idea of putting this in yet. All right. Um, but this is where the fish are counted. And people stand over here and then watch that board and count however many fish are coming over in any 10 minute period. So you sign up for an hour, but you only count for 10 minutes. So ah. even though it's an investment of probably about 20 minutes by the time you're done, 
um, you're only actively counting fish for about 10 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the spawning window on average tends to run through April 1st through about June 15th at the latest. Mm -hmm. Although the vast majority of runs in this town are done by the middle of May, um, depending on how brutal your winter is and how late the arrival of the herring is, because it's all temperature related. Okay. This is our counter box. Um, it says Barnstable Natural Resources Herring Count Program, aptly named. Inside of the box are all of the goodies that you need for counting. So you have here your water thermometer complete with very long strings so you can dip it in the water and kind of stand on it while you're taking your temperature. Um, we also have our for getting the temperature outside in the air because the water temperature and the air temperature are different and both need to be recorded. Okay. Um, we also have our tally counter so that way if you're in the height of the run and there are tons of fish passing and you don't have the ability to just count them in your brain you can just hit the tally counter every time you see a fish pass and then after your 10 minutes you can record whatever number is there. I want to volunteer. Okay. <laughs> Happy to have you. So I think I need some formal training. How does that happen? So um, each year Heather Rockwell and I um, come together to do a joint herring counter training. Um, depending on the size of the group or if there say for instance is road work being done on Route 149, that may change the location. Um, in previous years it's been at Liberty Hall, this upcoming year it's at the Osterville Library. Um, and you come for a couple hours. We have refreshments and light snacks. We, I sort of give you an update on the status of all of the herring runs in town. Um, we usually try to have a keynote speaker every year to discuss something specific to your river herring that people might find of interest. Um, and then we physically go through the box, show you how to count. Um, there's a breakdown of how to get an account for um, the volunteer software and then we show you how to set up your login and then how to pick the dates and then how to check your schedule um, and all those sorts of things throughout the training. But, but what's the benefit to the town as is, is individual residents? Why should we do this? Well, I think it's important for people to get outside. Um, and there seems to be a large trend now where people just don't meander outside as often as they used to. I think it's also important for people to know what goes on in your local environment. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't even know that we have herring runs in this town that don't know what a river herring is. And I think that it's important for people to have an emotional and personal connection to their environment environment because we believe that an educated um, public is a more compassionate and more compliant public. So you know having additional eyes down here um, during the daytime helps us if there are poaching events or tells us sort of you know locations where there may be issues going on um, and it really just you know shows people and gives them a better education of their local environment. Excellent, thank you. Spending the day out on the water caring for a rack of oyster from seed to market is the dream of many residents. Shellfishing 101 may be just the course you are looking for to explore the opportunities and innovation of the blue economy. A growing business in the blue economy, aquaculture. Here with me today, Abigail Archer, a marine specialist with the county mm -hmm. and shellfishing. You have to learn how to do it if you want to get a grant. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you do at the county uh, in the marine specialties. Sure. So I'm an extension agent, and so uh, I have two colleagues that I work with, Josh Weitzma and Diana Murphy. So we're all part of the marine program with Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. And basically our job is to talk to people who work in marine industries on the Cape, um, figure out what kind of challenges they're encountering, what kind of questions they have, and figure out if there's way that scientific research can aid them in that. Um, so we work really closely with the shellfish aquaculture industry. We also work closely with the shellfish department, natural resources departments on, on each of the, the towns in Barnstable County. Right, and Barnstable, uh, the town of Barnstable mm -hmm. has a growing aquaculture industry. Uh, yes, across the state, aquaculture is growing. Definitely. Right, so give us some of those stats that you have come up with. Yeah, so um, across the whole Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there's 1,300 acres under cultivation, so people are growing primarily oysters, but also quahogs, um, and are experimenting with some other species as well. Half of those acres are in Barnstable County, so wow. 660 acres in Barnstable County um, are under aquaculture. Um, the value of oyster landings in Massachusetts was $27 million in 2017, so that's right. the year that we have most recent data for. 
a little over half of that is just from Barnstable County. Wow. Um, so it's about 14 million. Uh, Barnstable alone, town of Barnstable alone, uh, six million dollars was brought in through oyster culture, just oysters. The value of quahogs total in the Commonwealth is uh, 28 million and most of that is coming from Wellfleet and Barnstable. That is just mm -hmm. amazing and when we talk about the blue economy and some of the industries that are around there, aquaculture really is a cornerstone of this economy. It employs people. So. Uh, in town of Barnstable, you've got 52 growers, but those are just the people whose names are listed on the grant. They then employ other people. They also buy seed from businesses. They also buy equipment. Um, they have to buy gas. They have to maintain their trucks. So you, know, you can add an economic multiplier to that. And there's, there's uh, much more of an effect that the industry has beyond just the people bringing in shellfish. Uh, uh -huh. Barnstable County, the total, there's uh, 270 growers. 270 mm -hmm. growers over the, mm -hmm. oh, that's just, uh, it's, it's mind boggling awesome. <laughs> to think of that because when you go out to the, the flats in Barnstable, if you're out there pleasure boating, you don't always see them because it's, you know, low tide is when you'll see them and they're, yeah. they're further out in the harbor. But when you're out there and you see it's just acres and acres of, of vessels that these seed and these uh, oysters are growing in. And one of the coolest parts about going out there, I think, any town you know, where, where there's a, um, a group of shellfish uh, aquaculture grants, people do things a little bit differently. There's a lot of experimentation. Everyone puts their own little spin on it, tries things, finds you know, the most... Um, the, the way that works best for their business plan, the most efficient way for them to work. Right. And we have, obviously, grants here in the town of Barnstable. Mm -hmm. um, we have people who transfer grants. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean as the grant holder you can go to the Shell Fishing 101, which I just love the, the name of this. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn how to be an uh, aquaculturalist here in the town of Barnstable or in the county. Yep. But you also have uh, the ability that you can work on this and not own a grant. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there are a lot of people who work on a shellfish grant who don't necessarily have their name on the lease. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of labor. It's a lot of work. So you need a lot of people to sort those shellfish and bag them up and transport them back to the landing. Uh, do all the paperwork for all of that as well. Right. Um, so yeah, the county, one of the things we do is offer um, workshops and classes for um, you know, topics that people are interested in. The Master Gardener program is mm -hmm. run through a cooperative extension. Um, but we, the marine program, we offer a Fundamentals of Shellfish Farming class. Um, right. So it's uh, eight weeks long. It's on Thursday nights from six to eight this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got, we cover a range of topics. And so people who are interested in getting into the shellfish farming industry, are um, in the class is designed for them, right. um, either who want to get their own grant or who want to work on a grant. But also we have a number of people from the community every year who just want to learn more about what their neighbors do. Um, they might work for a nonprofit organization. They just want to learn more about the industry. Um, so right. th those folks are welcome in the class as well. So let's talk a little bit about the eight weeks. So mm -hmm. uh, obviously I'm sure the first week is orientation and yes. you know <laughs> why are you here kind of uh, class. Yes, and right, and so there's an opportunity for all the class um, participants to learn from each other. So we definitely have a who are you, why are you here section of that, right. that introduction. Um, yeah, and the basics we'll go over um, aquaculture in a, a world context, you know, what are the species being raised land-based aquaculture versus um, water, marine-based aquaculture, which is mostly what happens on the Cape. Right. Um, yeah, and then we'll figure out what questions people have. What do they want to learn about? What are their goals from the class? So we make sure we're you know, hitting all the subjects that, that right. they feel like they need to be successful. Um, and then the next uh, class after that will be understanding seed supply and shellfish nursery culture. And um, that's a big one, and that's actually is. another, I hate to keep using the word, <laughs> growing <laughs> industry is the seed specifically. Yeah. Um, ARC, the hatchery is, uh, you know, world-renowned now uh, with, with their work. Yeah, yeah, so we've got the ARC hatchery is the one, um, you know, closest to us. There's a couple of other hatcheries in the area. Um, farmers will also sometimes get their seed from a hatchery in Maine. There's one in Long Island. Um, yeah, so it's a big part of the business. You need right. to figure out plan ahead, you know, how right. many seed are you going to buy? How much space do you have to grow them out? How much time is it going to take to actually grow them up to big shellfish that you can then market? Right. Um, but it all starts with figuring out, okay, how many, how much seed are you going to order this year? Right, mm. and then what I thought was one of the things that I learned when we did a video um, on this particular subject was 
there's all sorts of vessels. So do you go over yeah. like how, where these seed go mm -hmm. and, and how they don't float away? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I know it is an amazing industry all in itself um, and just visually stunning when you go to visit the hatchery. So right. there's going to be a field trip to um, Aquaculture Research Corporation, okay. the ARC hatchery in Dennis. Um, and so, yes, Lisa Barasa, uh, one of the staff members there, will give us a tour and show us right. how she grows all the um, algae to then feed the little shellfish to right. help them grow big and strong so they can then grow out in people's grants. Right. And then when you get out into the grants, I I'm sure this is another class, too, that you'll have is... Everybody has their own way. Some are using the big mm -hmm. crates and some are using other types of vessels. Everybody thinks they have the, the secret sauce, mm -hmm. right? So, right, there, there's so much innovation in this industry. So, um, uh, we used to run a mini grant program. So, we get funding through the state to then make available to farmers to propose an idea and try it out. So, it was a way to sort of subsidize some of the risk of trying out a new idea. And so a lot of ideas that came through that, that mini-grant program in the early 90s, early 2000s, are now just like accepted practices today. So it's really gratifying to go out there and see things that were experiments right. being actively part of someone's business now. So yeah, yeah. but there's a, um, a class on, we'll split it up into oyster farming and then quahog farming. Okay. So for the oyster farming, we'll go over all the different methods. So you can grow oysters just on the bottom with no gear. Um, you can put them in cages, you can put them in racks and bags, there's even um, floating gear, there's hanging gear that actually uses the uh, motion of the waves to rock the oysters back and forth and um, chip <laughs> off the ends and so they grow with that, that nice deep cup. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And so part of the class will be to you know, expose people to those different ways um, and, and we'll have guests. Yeah, and then, oh, yeah, quahog growing too. So a lot of the industry started right. off on the Cape as growing quahogs, and then right. people got into oysters. And now 94% of the shellfish aquaculture industry in Massachusetts is oysters grown for the half shell industry. Oh. Um, so it's almost a monoculture. Um, but the people who are growing quahogs are getting decent prices for them now because they're. Right. There's a demand for them and not as many growers as there used to be. So. And so many guest speakers, too. Yes. Oh, my goodness. We, yeah. And the, the speakers who come in are sometimes people who took the class, you know, way back. Um, people who are, you know, they're excited about the industry and they're happy to, to share the things that they've learned and, you know, give people a leg up so they're not making the same mistakes. Right. Um, We've heard, too, um, you know, there's always this concern of uh, safety uh, mm -hmm, in yeah. this industry. Yeah. So do you cover in a class the safe handling of shellfish and, yep. and, you know, what you're looking for, what you're supposed to do in some of these instances? Yeah, so um, we haven't confirmed all our speakers on that day yet, but what we've done in the past is, yeah, we have a whole class focused on safety, both, you know, personal safety and then safe handling of shellfish. Right. Um, so, yeah, we'll go over all of the, um, the regulations regarding vibrio control, um, so time to temperature, making sure that your shellfish um, get on ice within the appropriate amount of time. Um, all the paperwork that needs to be filled out so that the shellfish can be traced back. Um, but and then also how to keep yourself safe when you're out in the water. So in the past we've had um, an environmental police officer come and talk about safety on the water, um, how to keep yourself safe, how to keep your employees safe. Um, well, that's fantastic. And I know our natural resource officers are out there, you know, making sure that our folks out mm. in the harbor are yeah. doing, you know, the things that they need to do to make sure that the food is safe as well as uh, yeah. they're safe on the water. Mm -hmm. One of the classes that really struck me is the business side of this. So yeah. this is a real business. Oh, yeah. You have to go to market with it. You need a marketing plan. You need mm -hmm. all of the things that a traditional business would do but with a twist of lemon. Yeah. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about that, that class. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, my colleague Josh Breitzma has prepared some enterprise budgets. We actually have a, um, uh, like an example budget. I think it's called Biff's Shellfish Farm. <laughs> and so we actually plan out, like, okay, if you're, you know, what, what's a three-year plan? You know, how are you going to obtain your seed? Um, how many years do you have to sort of carry, you know, the investment that you put in it before you actually make a profit back? Um, yeah, that, that is the most like real part of the class. We re really want to let people know what, what the expectations are for when they'll actually be able to make a profit um, and how right. much investment is required up front. But there's a lot of help on the Cape. Um, so uh, we've brought in folks from SCORE Business Consulting um, and then also the um, Lower Cape, um, or Cape, uh, 
Community Development. Thank you, Community <laughs> Development Corporation. I knew yeah. exactly what yeah. you were talking about. <laughs> um, so yeah, they provide help with business planning. So we'll, we'll let people know about what, what resources are available in the community as well. All right. And who goes to this class mm -hmm. again? So we've, so we've been offering this class since 2008, and we usually offer it every other year. This year there was so much interest. This would have been an off year, but there were so many people who wanted to participate, we decided to run it. But we've had 160 students since, since 2008. Um, and they come from all of the Cape Cod towns, but then also from um, Plymouth, you know, Plymouth County towns, a lot mm -hmm. from Plymouth because they have a lot of acreage yep. um, that's under cultivation. A lot of the Buzzards Bay communities as well. Um, and it runs the gamut. There are people who, um, you know, want to be involved in the industry and who have now gone on to successfully right. get grants themselves or, or you know, work with partners. Um, and it's so much fun to see those okay. people out on the flats. Uh, but yeah, then the people who um, they're just curious. I mean, we had one woman come last year who just she wanted to learn more about what their neighbors did because they saw the equipment out there, but they didn't really know. So that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, when does the class start, and how do people get into this so class? So class starts March 21st. Okay. It'll run eight weeks between March 21st and May 9th. So it'll be on Thursday nights. Um, to sign up, we do. you can go to the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension website and the information is there under workshops. Um, but uh, we still do things a little old school at the county, so we actually have a form that one needs to fill out by hand um, and then mail in a check. Um, the class costs $150 um, per person. Um, and then you can mail in a check or deliver it by hand to the Cooperative Extension office. Is there a uh, limited seating in this um, class? Yeah, it's, so it's going to be in the Harborview room of okay. Barnstable County, so there, there's only so many people that can fit in there. Um, the maximum, we need at least 15 people to run the class. I, that's not going to be a problem. Um, and then 40 people is the maximum. Um, so it is first come, first serve. What do you want folks in the town of Barnstable mm -hmm. to know about this industry and where it's going? Yeah, there is a lot of room for innovation, and even though it's mostly dominated by oysters right now, um, there's possibilities for growing other species that we're looking into. So um, surf clams, you know, the big clams, but if you grow them small, they can get marketed as butter clams. Um, so we're doing a bunch of research right now with farmers to test out growing methods for that. Also blood arcs or blood clams um, is another uh. species. Turns out there's, there's quite a market for those, and most of them come from the wild fishery. Um, and so there's opportunity to figure out some culture techniques for that too. So it's aquaculture is growing. You know, it's, it's, it's grown in the state tremendously, especially from the 1980s, 90s, 2000s. Um, but there's, there's lots of room to keep innovating. Here's to innovation in the blue economy. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Abigail. Thank you very much for inviting me. Here is a look at things to do, places to go, and people to meet. St. Nickerson says don't miss it. The 1.9 mile 14th annual Cape Cod St. Patrick's Day Parade is Saturday, March 9th along Route 28. It begins at 11 a.m. The theme of this year's St. Patrick's Day Parade in Yarmouth is the spirit of community. And that spirit has reached far beyond Cape Cod to the wider New England region and across the ocean. The theme came from the parade committee's decision to honor Yarmouth Police Sergeant Sean Gannon, who was killed in the line of duty last April 12th. A highlight will be Gannon's canine partner, Nero, who was the severely injured in the incident, leading a contingent of more than 50 canines from many police departments. Comments, suggestions, accolades? Connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. Email us or send us an old-fashioned note by Carrier Pigeon. Channel 18 works. For you, I'm Paula Hersey, and thank you for watching Barnstable today.